Hello and welcome to another episode of Fantasy Pitching, I'm Adam and today I will be looking at the upcoming Spider-Man 3 movie, title yet unconfirmed. As with any upcoming feature I will be using the most up to date confirmations and fashion and narrative and will ultimately be looking back at this to see whether or not it was a whole lot of hooey. Spider-Man 3 is the third feature, directed by John Watts, and sees Tom Holland once again take the role of the friendly neighbourhood's web-slinger. Zendaya, Jacob Batalon, Marissa Tomei, and Tony Revolori are all returning for their respective roles as MJ, Ned Leeds, Aunt May, and Flash Thompson. It was confirmed earlier on that this will also feature Benedict Cumberbatch as Dr. Stephen Strange, potentially taking the Avenger-related mentor role that we've seen in previous films with Tony Stark, Nick Fury, and kinda sorta Quentin Beck in the previous Spider-Man movies. The cast gets interesting still, with the inclusion of Alfred Molina as Dr. Octopus and Jamie Foxx as Electro two Spider-Man villains from two separate Spider-Man franchises, and it has all been but confirmed that previous Spider-Men, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, along with their respective love interests, Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane Watson and Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy, will also feature in the movies at some point. So this is where the pitching begins. We last left Peter Parker at the end of 2019's Spider-Man Far From Home with the surprising cameo from J.K. Simmons as a returning question mark, version of J. Jonah Jameson in sort of an Alex Jones in Four Wars style version of the newspaper editor. He reveals to the public at large that Quentin Beck's Mysterio had edited and dropboxed a video that made it look like Spider-Man had killed him and orchestrated the attack on London Bridge. Not only that, but Mysterio has also leaked Spider-Man's real identity and broadcast it around the world. Prior to the reveal, only the Avengers, Nick Fury and Associates, Ned Leeds, Aunt May, MJ, Happy Hogan and Michael Keaton's Vulture were the only ones aware of Spider-Man's true identity and, now that the stage is set to make it look like Spider-Man is a most wanted criminal. Prior to the addition of the new or old cast members, the idea that there was a manhunt for Spider-Man would lead towards people like Craven Hunter, Scorpion, the Punisher, or the Spider Slayers being the antagonists, since they have all been contracted to kill Spider-Man in the past. However, the idea of the different universes clashing may instead make these characters a little too small time. So, before we look at Spider-Man's future, we need to take a brief step back to look at Spider-Man's contractual history. The rights of Spider-Man were bought by Sony way back in 1999, and remains there to this day. There was the successful Sam Raimi trilogy, Raimi is now directing Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness, more on that later. Then the less successful Amazing Spider-Man films by Mark Webb, ending in 2014's dismal Amazing Spider-Man 2, see Electro. The MCU was in full swing at this point, and the plan was to build a Spider-Verse, or in that soon, with spin-offs and sequels including Amazing Spider-Man 3, Silver Sable, Black Cats, Silver and Black, Sinister Six, Venom, Morbius, The Living Vampire, and an animated Spider-Man movie, hold on, and an Ant May prequel. The disappointing results of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 halted nearly all of these movies, and Spider-Man could appear to have been a dead brand. That was until a deal was stuck between Marvel and Disney, where Spider-Man could appear in Avengers related movies starting with Captain America Civil War and two solo movies that Sony and Disney would co-produce. Spider-Man Homecoming was always likely to be a success, but the addition of Tony Stark's Iron Man that drew more attention than not from people who may have been suffering from Spider-Man fatigue. With the rights of Spider-Man still in the pocket of Sony, they went on to produce their own movies with Venom and the upcoming sequel Morbius and the animated Into the Spider-Verse, all having no connection to the MCU apart from maybe Morbius. 
Hold on. Negotiations broke down in August 2019 between Marvel and Sony, and it looked like Spider-Man was set to continue in a non-MCU world. Both parties would have been successful regardless, but it worked out for the best when the deal was once again reached, and now Spider-Man is back in Marvel's cinematic universe for the foreseeable future. Sony planned to continue on with Watson Holland, and rumours were that they would try and link things back to the previous two iterations of Spider-Man, since the fan service to the MCU would be gone and Into the Spider-Verse was so successful. So to me, the plan was always to have a multiverse based movie, which coincides well with WandaVision, see one of my previous episodes, and Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. My pitch involves the idea that Peter Parker needs help in proving that he is not the villain Mysterio painted him out to be, as well as to prove that he is not Spider-Man either as well as being hunted down by an unstoppable collection of villains. So, he goes to his most trusted voice that he can think of in the form of Doctor Strange, who is dealing with the multiverse and acronyms sent from the events of the WandaVision series. Who is the villain then? The answer is The Inheritors, a race of immortal vampires that feed on deity totems, and in this case, Spider-Man. They were at the centre of the comic book stories Spider-Verse and Spider-Geddon and travel dimension to dimension killing Spider-Men, a bit like Highlander or Jet Li's The One. With the barriers between dimensions weaker than ever, these Baddens can move freely between the dimensions killing Spider-Men and now Spider-Man is in a game of cat and mouse trying to prepare Spider-Man while staying out of their grasp. Because Electro, Gwen Stacy and Doc Ock died at the end of their subsequent movies, it suggests that Holland Spider-Man will meet these characters mid Spider-Man 2 and The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Because I'm not a fan of the movies that involve time, travel, dimension jumping, if it means that it's going to affect what we remember from previous iterations, please see Men in Black 3 or Don't, none of the three caught Spider-Men should die but I do perceive the idea of a montage of various unnamed Spider-Men getting killed by the Inheritors in an homage to the baby murders of the Omen 3. The finale would see the Inheritors using their knowledge of Spider-Man to remain on Earth 616 holding hostage everyone's loved ones, knowing that they will have to come to them in order to save them. So he brings the two big lads from their previous universes, and maybe some cannon fodder, in on the action in order to match the overwhelming odds. With MJ, Aunt May, etc. in hand, they fall back to Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum and hold down the fort from the Inheritor's onslaught, while Doctor Strange begins finding totems that will banish the foes into a realm they cannot escape from. The Spider-Man are all saved from mega murder when the Inheritors are defeated, but before they return to their worlds, Holland's Peter surrenders himself to the police for a very public trial. He turns down Stark's lawyer, offered by Happy Hogan, Jennifer Walters, as it could confirm suspicions that Spider-Man was backed by a billionaire Tony Stark, and instead opts for a public defender, Matt Murdock. Cool idea, right? As the evidence is mounting against him, they conveniently turn on the news, because it's a movie after all, to see Spider-Man in front of a large crowd in Times Square. He does some nice flips and web stuff to prove that he is Spider-Man, then removes his mask to reveal it was Andrew Garfield. In doing so, he admits that his name is in fact Peter Parker to the audience at home, and clearly not that world's according to us. He states that he could not let Tom Holland's character's innocent youth take the blame and wanted to come clean, but reiterating that he did not murder Quentin Beck and shoots off into New York's skyline before the police can catch him. With this evidence in hand, the criminal charges against Holland are dropped and he is free to go. He later meets up with the remaining Spider-Men and thanks them for their help. They point out that though Peter Parker is still in the clear, there's still a large portion of New York that believes that Spider-Man is a murderer, so things may never be the same again for him. The two Spider-Men return to their worlds to find out that their subsequent villains are missing in action. It is revealed that Doc Ock and Electro, maybe some others, who knows, have escaped to Earth-616 and formed an alliance with the Vulture and Morbius, as teased in the Morbius trailer, and are now well on their way to forming the Sinister Six. 
I'm in two minds as to whether or not they should form on Earth 616 or another world, because it is most likely that Sinister Six movie would be its own thing as opposed to the villains of Spider-Man 4. Therefore, it would be likely that it would be done solely by Sony as opposed to a joint venture. The big question is whether or not it would be confirmed what universe Venom belongs to. If the MCU let him in, then the Sinister Six could go to San Francisco instead of a hero-heavy New York City. Therefore, they will fall into Venom's jurisdiction. The movie would end with Peter coming across a young man named... Yep, Miles Morales, who boasts the beginning of Spider-Man's gained powers which would set up the sequel where instead of having a mentor figure like he has had in the past, Peter is now the one who's the mentor for this young man. With great power comes great responsibility, right? Wait, what if Maguire and Dunst are actually young alternate versions of Aunt May and Uncle Ben? Hmm, well it's too late for that anyway. Anyway. Leave a comment what you think about this pitch and I'll see you in the next video.